YouTube, the land of... You have no respect! Oh my god! Show soon! No talent! Mediocre piece of shit! I don't care what you say! Let me share a little context. When I decided to make a series of podcasts about photography and filmmaking, I wanted there to be an open door policy where a conflict photographer may appear in one episode to be followed by a wedding storyteller, news gatherer, landscape shooter, YouTuber in the next. Perhaps subconsciously, my guest today may have affirmed that decision to make an episodic podcast where quality is more important than the sheer quantity of episodes I'm able to record, edit and deliver. And that's the wonderful thing about this medium. There are no rules. It's a democratized environment. In the free world, at least, you're able to make pretty much what you want in whatever style you choose. And it seems to me the only ones who shout saturation point are usually those who don't like the idea they'll have to work just that little bit harder to find their voice in the sea of noise that's a frustrating swell to some and thunderous exciting surf to others. If 700,000 shows to choose from in the podcasting world, current figures mid-2019, seems somewhat saturated as a platform, imagine the cacophonous noise that is 5 billion videos from 50 million creators with 1 billion hours of content consumed every day on the YouTube platform. To my mind, that gives podcasting a little wiggle room yet. The word awesome is a word you'll hear often on YouTube, and usually it seems to describe something that isn't truly, actually, contextually awesome at all. The power of the ocean is awesome. The energy released from the sun is awesome. The latest lipstick by insert your favorite brand is probably not worthy of the word, but awesome, I think, could rightly be associated with some of those numbers you've just heard. YouTubers will do almost anything to garner and court an audience, it seems. Some have fought their closest competitors in boxing rings, married for views, even sadly and literally died for their view count. And it's this kind of behavior that's brought many detractors to the microphone to denounce the freedom afforded the millions of filmmakers on YouTube. Where once our children fancied the idea of becoming doctors, train drivers and astronauts, you'd be just as likely in a classroom survey of impressionable school kids to hear YouTuber as their chosen occupation of the future. These are probably things you may already know, but it does lay out the YouTube Pantone red carpet for my guest in this focus edition of Photography Daily. My photographer guest hasn't followed the conventional rules suggested by the thousands of films on how to build a YouTube following. He doesn't really do kit reviews and shies from controversy and actually only promises to produce one film a month, whilst current thinking suggests you should be producing as much as you can, as quickly as you can, as often as you can. He's a thinker, he's a photographer, and as he approaches the quarter million mark in terms of subscribers, I thought it was a good time to try and find out how a photographer of his caliber and mindset courts and makes films for the most successful video outlet on this planet. Sean Tucker agreed to talk and share his story from his front room, or in YouTube language, his studio set. But first, if you're new to Sean's work, here's his YouTube channel trailer. I'm more interested in the why of photography than the how. There are loads of channels out there enthusiastically giving you gear reviews and top 10 lists, but that's not this channel. There will be practical tips along the way, but the meat of what I want to share with you won't be tech heavy. Besides, I believe that a photographer who really sees but has a cheap camera will produce better images than a photographer with the best gear but no vision every time. I'm not a daily vlogger. I'm not even a weekly one. The most I can manage at the moment is about once a month. But that also means that I'm not going to fill this channel with repeats of other info online or attempt to stretch a little bit of content a long way. I want every video to feel fresh and rich and hopefully that makes them worth the wait. My photography heroes, the people I emulate, are not just good at their craft, they're philosophers and thinkers and interesting human beings. And this reminds me that the work I produce will come more out of who I am than the gear that I use. So sometimes this channel will be as much about life as the discipline of photography, because I think you have to be more present in order to see better. And you have to see better in order to capture life more compellingly. 
and communicate what you see to others through your images. So welcome to the journey. It's a surreal feeling um, meeting somebody you know through having watched what feels like a, a box set of their life. And now I'm actually in your um, loosely described as YouTube set, which is your, <laughs> which is your front room. The, uh, uh, where, where, how much of this is front room and how, how much of, of this is, is set? Uh, it's, it's definitely more lounge, yeah. I think it's, when, you, when you see it in the flesh, you realise that there's, you know, you know, TVs and Playstations and books on shelves and stuff. It's, it's not as clean as it looks in a video. Yeah. I wonder how much your, your wife feels this is the, the, the living room and, and Sean's set. Well, th- thankfully, she's a freelancer as well, so she kind of she kind of gets it. Um, we, we're both in pretty creative fields, so we we just I mean, like you see behind my couch over there, you can see it's just bags of lighting equipment and light stands and tripods, and we you know. <laughs> see, I'm delighted to see that because my my place is like that. And I was thinking, where can I hide stuff? And I, I, I come into this this um, this setting, and I'm thinking, well. You know, Sean's not a million miles away from where I am, really. He has to hide stuff, too. <laughs> and not very well, because, like, if you walk in, you could see it all. It's a mess, yeah. So um, it's, I know you've answered this question over and over, and I've seen you uh, on other YouTube films answer these questions, and I've heard you on podcasts, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to relate um, the story for a new audience, because there's always a fresh audience. There's always a new audience. And the story for you seems to... Uh, in this biography seems to start at around about age eight when you make a photograph of a gull and that's a, a seminal part of this story isn't it yeah um it was i think i'd gone through a bit of a rough upbringing like my dad had left at three four years old and so my mom and my brother and i we were all living in africa at the time because he'd, he'd taken us over to africa uh I decided to come back to the uk uh and i mean my brother was gosh, six months old when we came back and I I was four years old. So the next sort of three or four years were quite rough. You know, my mom being on her own trying to make things work and and us being suddenly without a dad, especially me because I was old enough to kind of have him disappear and feel the pain of that. My brother was a bit too small and not knowing what was going on and feeling very rootless. Um, And at some point I got a little... Uh, just a point, you know, the point and shoot, zip, zip, wind on cameras. And and uh, we'd gone for a trip to the beach for the day. We lived down uh, in just outside Bath at the time. So we'd gone to the coast somewhere um, in Somerset. And uh, I, I was running around taking little photos on this thing. And, and I managed to sneak close to a seagull that was sitting on a, on a railing. And it let me get really close, probably because he thought I had food. And... Um, yeah, I got this shot and then went and got it developed. And uh, remember my mom looking over my shoulder while I was kind of thumbing through the photographs. And she got, we got to the photograph of the gull and she looked over my shoulder and went, wow, that's a, that's a really great photograph. And, you know, when you're that age and, you know, seven, eight years old or whatever it was, and you're, you, my mom was obviously trying to deal with everything that was happening to her and the responsibility she had and the pain of losing this relationship and this marriage. And so she didn't, ha- not through fault of her own, she didn't have a lot of attention to give, I don't think. She was just in crisis mode the whole time. That moment stood out as, as affirmation that I, I really, really needed. Like, gosh, this is, this is um, I want more of that. And I think somewhere in my head, I probably linked that to photography. And, and it would be years and years before I became a photographer. But I think somewhere in my head, that, that, um, that affirmation, doing a, doing a good thing that someone else appreciated kind of took root. Did you ever have a chance to discuss how important that affirmation has been with her? No, she, she watched, because I mentioned it in one of the videos I put out. She did watch the video um, and sort of got hold of me and said, oh, you know, I think I have that photograph somewhere because she kind of hung on to all that stuff. I didn't keep all that stuff from being a kid. So, so she has it somewhere. We haven't, we haven't dug Tell it. Tell me you've, you've, you've found it. No, I, have, I haven't. No. Well, because w- most of that stuff is back in South Africa at the moment and my mom is now living over here. So it's in storage somewhere. So we'd have to go back and sort of dig it out. But I think her hearing stuff like that was quite interesting for her to kind of get the other side of what was going on in me at the time because I think for her that whole period was a bit of a welter of emotions I remember your um, your thank you film when you reached 100,000 subs yeah. and you shared uh, this story about being at school and having very low self-confidence uh, when it came to standing in front of uh, of your peers and, and having to um, having to perform if you like and uh, it was the, the English oral wasn't it the, yeah, uh, yeah. 
And um, and and you, I I love that expression you used. You said I I lacked that look at me gene. Yeah. Um, seminary turned that around for you, although in a in a reasonably frightening way, didn't it? Yeah, I suppose because I knew I I wanted at the time. I mean, to be a pastor, priest, whatever you want to call it, that was what I wanted to do in my life, and a big part of that was going to be communicating to rooms full of people. And I wanted to be able to do that well, but but something about my, I mean, I just don't have that in my personality to to want to do that naturally. There's nothing in me that, but because I had a, a goal that I wanted the outcome from that, and that was going to be a tool I had to have in my toolbox, I sort of pushed myself to do it. And we had these uh, preaching classes that used to, do. so it was torture because they, they they split it in two halves and you'd have 45 minutes up front where if it was your turn then you would stand up for 45 minutes and give a message of some sort uh, then you'd have a five minute break and then the class would come back in and for the second 45 minutes they would shred you so this didn't make sense the way you structured it didn't make sense that story you told i didn't believe you hold your hands weird you 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 make funny expressions with your face just pulling apart everything trying to help you um, get better. I, re- I remember one, I mean, behind you on the wall, you've got sort of photos of three of my mentors. The guy on the left there is a guy named Vic. And he was one of my seminary lecturers. He was a guy who ran those preaching class. And he, he is a, a guy I respect so much and really cared about making me the best I could be. But I remember this crushing day where I'd finished whatever message it was and everyone else had gone around the class and been their normal picky selves, but he always had something beautiful to say at the end of it. Like everyone said stuff, but I really think this, he, he on that day just looked at me and said, I think it's worse than everyone said, Sean, if I'm honest, I feel like you insulted me today. And I'm like, Oh gosh, you know, and it was those kind of things. And, and he's, he's one of these people who says the truth and then feels bad about it afterwards and came and found me afterwards. And I, I want you to know, like I said that because I believe in you. And, and it was just experiences where it, it it was really hard for my personality to do that, but I I pushed myself because I wanted to get good at communicating. It wasn't he the one that said, "I think you le- need to learn to grieve human humanity." Wasn't that that was a an expression I think he used? Yeah, but he I, was well known for those. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean he 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 uh, he knew I was a very angry young twenty something who was a bit of an iconoclast and wanted to change the world and tear the church apart especially because i thought it made all the wrong things important i still do but like then i was i was keen to break stuff because of it and he picked that up early on and just sort of pulled me aside and said i just think you need to learn to grieve humanity which i didn't i didn't understand you know i kind of sat with that because you don't understand when he says something like that he was one of those guys who did used to drop stuff i think i mentioned one of the videos um one of my friends when because you have to go for interviews to actually be accepted for seminary and um, one of my friends said in his interview, Vic had sort of cornered him and said, uh, you know, everyone else had asked very obvious questions. You know, what church do you go to? How long do you, have you been a Christian? What sort of stuff do you want to do and change the world? And he stops and he just, uh, he goes, um, so who wounds you? Like, as if like, I mean, what kind of question is that? I don't, I don't know. Like, you just feel like you need to burst into tears and start telling your words. He always had these things he'd drop in, which were, you couldn't answer straight away. There was There was loads to unpack in a very, very, few words that would you know so set you off so grieve humanity for me was a turning point that he gave me just because i i think me wanting to change the rest of the world and feeling angry about that things weren't right and should be right and i was a, a big idealist was was him telling me well we're all messed up we're all a mess like you can't imp- like bully the rest of the world and impose your idealism on it when you're messed up, I'm messed up, even though you don't think I am. We all struggle, we're all looking out for ourselves, we're all hurting each other because we're trying to protect our own patch and maybe you just need to let some of that go. And he didn't lay that out for me, he just said those two words and left it with me and that's the kind of stuff that surfaced. So he was just one of those guys, yeah. Do those things he said then now make sense? More and more, like it's it's stuff that, uh, and, and I was very lucky in seminary, we had four lecturers who really were... Um, made you think for yourself they, they wouldn't lay out answers for you and tell you this is what we think you should believe and three out of four of them were fired before i left or moved on because because they weren't producing cookie cutter pastors because it was this amazing uh period i got at that particular um institution where where there were people encouraging you to think for yourself which which might be the reason i didn't last because in- encouraging me to think for myself meant i was never going to last because i went out and started saying this stuff and thinking for myself and I was way too liberal, was never going to slot in then. And, and, and I didn't buy things I didn't buy and wasn't going to pretend I did, you know. Thinking is a theme returned to frequently during Sean's YouTube films. In one such story about the Stoics, not a theme you'd likely encounter on many photographic channels, 
He talks about what we as professionals, photographic or otherwise, can and can't control. To my mind, some are sermonic testimonies that nearly always end with creative inspiration. When commentators refer to an MP passing comment about them being the greatest prime minister we never had, or sports hosts lament a coach's choice of quarterback as being the most important one that got away, I can't help feeling that photography's gain is most certainly the house of God's loss. Though if there were ever a church with a small sea of creatives, there would most certainly have been a queue at the oak door to hear him speak. If seminary left Sean with one thing, it's that incredible ability to communicate with people on all levels about subjects we often spend our artisan hours at night awake thinking about. I understand what I'm about to say is going to be unpopular, especially in the capitalist West where we're told that the harder you work, the more you will have guaranteed success. Or pseudo-philosophies like The Secret that tell you if you imagine something up or dream it or want it, you'll get it. I don't believe that. Uh, I believe that success isn't actually your responsibility. Your responsibility is to be the very best at what you do as you possibly can manage. And that doesn't necessarily guarantee success, but it's absolutely worth risking for. It's perhaps your, your breakaway seminary style that, that unwittingly, I think, has been one of the causes of your success. I mean, the, the fact that when you, you learned to preach, you practiced in, in this style um, and there is a quote that I, I had written down as where you could be as honest about your own fears and doubts as possible, I, I think was really important. Do you think it's this laid bare honesty that, that's made you or projected you so swiftly in, in terms of YouTube? I don't know. I think so. Uh, looking at the comments you get and the community that builds around it, it's definitely what people talk about the most on my channel and it, it was it was a decision early on because when I started in photography I went to YouTube like everybody else does to learn skills and teach yourself which is great you can do that today it's amazing and I was often really disheartened by watching YouTubers who you know most of their video ended up being a marketing tactic of look how great I am look how much success I have and all the clients that want to work with me and then a month later you'd see they disappeared because they went bankrupt I'm like oh you were lying you you were just saying stuff because the whole point of you making videos was to show off about how great you are and how discouraging that was to me trying to teach myself going well if this guy's doing this and he's got so many clients what's wrong with me why can't I make this work and I made a choice that I would never make videos like that that I would be as honest about where it's not working and failing and how, how little work I actually get in as a photographer and how it's a constant struggle even if I have a YouTube channel that's working. It's still a struggle and still difficult to make things work. And and the, the one guy who stands out, I think, was uh, Zach Arias, who, yeah, who, who, who the tone of his videos felt a bit different to me. And he was someone I, I, I latched onto earlier. And there was a video he did for Scott Kelby's channel, I think, called Transform. This the one where he said, I'm moving a thousand miles down. Uh, I can't remember. The, it's such a beautiful quote, but I yeah. can't remember it. Yeah, and it's sort of very ambient, lots of sort of B-roll and voiceover. And it was very, very honest about how it wasn't working for him. And I thought that... That video made an impression on me and I, and I always wanted to be at least that honest and say where it wasn't working because I think if I'm genuinely not just trying to show off about the fact that I think I'm a good photographer and I'm trying to help people because I think that's what a lot of people do on YouTube is there's a, they, they've got this veil of I want to educate people but it, it's mostly about promoting themselves and I, I didn't want to fall into that trap so I'm very deliberate about being honest about where things are difficult or or where my work didn't meet my own standards or other people's standards or where you know money was tight or because then it encourages people to know that the difficulties in their journey are everyone's there's safety in numbers we can just keep going together and I, then I think I am more likely to help the danger of course is that people can contrive that that scenario as well I've seen Phil Films. Um, I've watched films where people talk of their struggles and I thought, oh, are you, are you really struggling or, or, or is this a struggle just to get figures? I mean, that's an integrity issue, isn't it? That's, you, you, you have to call yourself on that. If, if, you're, if you've now using vulnerability as a gimmick, then you're going to, uh, I mean, like you've seen through it. I think it is easy to, th to see through and people can usually pick up the difference. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely... It, it's what I did in the church. It's it's what I do on YouTube. It's it's what I hopefully will always do. I I I I, I don't like building deeper friendships or relationships with people where I can't really trust what you're saying or I feel like you're trying to impress me the whole time. We're not going to go very far. The people I build around me are people like that. It's it's what I relate to. So it's what I'm very hard on myself about putting out to the rest of the world as well. Was there one? 
it was only one video. It, it's difficult because I, 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 th I feel I know your back catalogue really quite intimately. Was there one where you think that's the one? It probably is the Snowdonia one right at the start, mm. isn't it? It's the one that, that uh, felt like the direction going forward for me. I'd, I'd done a few tutorials, some more dry product tutorials, which is still on my channel which did all right, but I didn't connect with them. And I don't, I think other people connected with them because it gave good info, not because there was anything more to it. But the Snowdonia one, again, I was being very vulnerable and saying that I was shooting in studios all week, very technical product photography, which wasn't very creative. So I'm going to put myself out there, go and shoot um, landscapes, which I don't do. It's not something I'm very good at. Just to try and refresh photography as a pursuit and discovery and by putting myself in a position where I didn't know what I was doing and, and people related to that because of the vulnerability in that and, and that felt like what I used to do with church. So it's like that's the way forward. Yeah, and that, that video did well and I think it got passed around a lot and that's where it, it ticked up for me a little bit on the channel. Yeah, and, and I saw the potential of something going well, forward. Yeah. Morning, I was up at five. And, uh, I mean, you, you hear this all the time, the photographer's game is kind of getting up when you think the light's going to be good, which is obviously before sunrise and right up to sunset. Try and find a spot and wait it out and hope the magic happens. Um, unfortunately, I mean, this is what I've chosen. I came up here last night and had a look, and it's got this beautiful view over this dam here. And I'm all set up, ready to go. And uh, it's very cloudy. So... So there are breaks in the cloud like up there, so I'm thinking maybe if I get lucky and uh, just get a clear spot, maybe we'll get some light coming through. But then again, what they don't tell you is you could sit here and, you know, you've woken up at five in the morning and hiked all the way up this mountain and uh, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be cloudy, but that's why I've, I suppose that's what the game is. So I'm going to hang out here for about... I mean, on my channel, the, the videos that do well are not the ones that I like. They're, they're, the, they're the info ones. It's like if I, if I, I think the, the most viewed one on my channel is about, you know, choosing, developing a color look to your images and how you dial that in custom. You don't rely on presets. I don't really care about that video. I care about something where I'm sitting and telling a bit of a story. They don't do as well. Like I just did one in January this year with my grandfather who was showing through images he took in 1945, 46, 47 when he was in the Navy, including, you know, the ruins of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and down to Australia and, and Singapore, Hong Kong and uh, amazing stories. Like I, I'm really happy I captured that and think it's, it's a good watch. Yes. This one, I hope you yeah. can see it. He is a Japanese prisoner of war. Mm. He'd been, we had him on board ship, a Japanese prisoners of war on board as the working party. Mm. And I, as they were leaving the ship, I stood at the bottom of the gangway with my brownie box camera, mm. ready to take photographs of some of them as they came off. And he's running at me. Mm to try and knock the camera out of my hand. Oh, gosh. But I did. But it's never going to get the traction of me telling you how to do colour theory. But I'm not out to build a techie channel. I, I want it to be the story-driven stuff. So I'll give the technical stuff every now and again because I don't mind and it's stuff I know. But I want to focus on the other stuff. Your, your videos have a, a very gentle pace. They start with a philosophical quote or maybe a, a couple of quotes. Uh, not, not just from photographic masters, though. Where, where did the idea for, for that come from? It's a, it's a wonderful way to start a film. I mean, I feel ex extremely, is the word appropriate, comfortable the moment I start watching a Sean Tucker film. That's lovely. Um, documentaries, really. I think a lot of, I, I love a documentary. I mean, I, I would rather watch a documentary than a feature film, like a, 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 a fiction um, and a lot of documentaries start with some kind of quote to set the theme. And I think that stuck somewhere. And I think the first time I did it was that Snowdonia video, um, something I'd read that week. Because when I, when I script a video or write down the ideas for it, I will throw in quotes that have sparked thinking around it that I don't necessarily include, but it just, it just helps me think around a theme. And at that point, when I was writing the script for that, I'm like, well, why not? You've got these quotes in there. They really sort of match what you're doing throw them up front in text and, and let it lead in with some, I think at that one I had shots of the river going past and just the ambient sound of the, of, the, of the water going past and it was a nice way to kind of slowly lead into it, I think. And, and you've uh, championed quality over quantity, there's no doubt about that. Um, uh, the, the reason for that, is, is that purely because these take so, so long to produce? 
a little bit it's and it's not the length of filming or editing even though that takes a long time it's more i feel like um the kind of stuff i want to do should feel rich in content and that takes time to live first and to think through and then to write and that's that takes the most time not the filming and the editing i can get that done in a few days it's 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 something, I mean, I have a list on my phone of topics. I've probably got 80, 90 topics ready to go, which if I'm only doing, you know, 12 to 20 videos a year, that's the next four years. But a lot of them aren't ready. They're ideas that I, I know I still need to do thinking around. And when I'm ready to do a video, I'll, I'll sort of thumb down that list and, and realize I've done enough living to write that script now. And then I can sit down and I can write out that script for a week or work on the idea and and, and that's what takes time. And I've, I watch too many YouTubers that I really like over time, I feel have started to dilute their content because they've given themselves a hectic schedule of two videos a week or something. I mean, I would not be able to do that and not dilute my content. There's no ways I could keep up with that schedule. I don't have a, something interesting to say every week. And I made a commitment early on. I only wanted to make stuff that I would want to watch. And I could only do that realistically I mean, I only promise one video a month on my channel in the trailer. I often do, at the moment I'm doing two, sometimes I did three last month, but I don't tell people that. I'm only promising one a month and when they're ready, they're ready. Um, and I, I, yeah, quality is more important. I never want to get to the stage where I'm diluting or stretching content thin because I'm trying to fill a schedule. You've broken the rules of YouTube, haven't you, really? You've talked about this before. You, um, as we approach, or as you approach, um, nearly a quarter million subs, um, all the rules of, of YouTube, you must make product videos, you must do at least once once a week, twice a week, perhaps. They've all been broken. Yeah. I mean, everyone said to me, if you want to do YouTube, it's consistency. You have to have a schedule and you have to stick to that schedule, create expectation. It's not that I don't have a schedule. I said once a month, I, I, but it's just very, very loose and sparse, the schedule. So I still stick to something that people can expect. I suppose it is, it, it's fast growth in a way and, and comparing it to other YouTubers, it's really slow. It's really not. So it's all, it's all relative. I know I could grow a lot faster if I made a video like I made when I switched to Sony cameras. That video exploded because it's about gear. I don't care about that video. I just knew I had to make it to explain some stuff. Otherwise, I'd have to answer comments about why I'm suddenly using a Sony camera like a heretic. So I, I made it. I know and, and, and the writing's on the wall. If I want this channel to grow really fast, make more of those. But I don't want to because I don't like those videos they're not interesting to me so it's a choice about liking the work you do or gaining followers are you doing it because you're keen to produce art you're really proud of or for fame and a bit of money like if we're honest none of us want fame more than we want art I think we just get caught up in it you know because it, it gets exciting for a second and before I started I already saw a bunch burn out or, or disappear and, and I, I kind of learned that lesson before I began and made a commitment. There's no ways I'm going down that path. So as slow as it takes or as fast as it takes or whatever happens, I'm going to do it this way and see what works. Last week I was uh, in my, my son's school. Um, Friday evening, we were doing, a, we were doing a, a, a pub quizzy kind of thing on a Friday night. And on the wall um, adjacent to where we were sat, were was was it was a wall of artwork with one day i would like to be mm -hmm. and amongst the the astronauts and doctors not not as many doctors as i'd like to have seen up on that wall uh, there were far too many youtubers yeah. i've given talks on this it's nuts it's it's uh, there was a study done it was in uh, i think it was a paper in canterbury on um, YouTube, they did some they did some studies in a, in a group of schools, and YouTuber came up number four as the, the 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 most desired career choice, which is terrifying because it's and this is what I I, I spoke to a group of guidance counselors from those from those schools because they asked someone to come down and talk about it and said you know don't let anyone d tell you that this is what they what they're going to do as a career just because the chances of it working out are so slim. Like it, the amount of people who start channels and bail are, are astronomically larger than, than those who succeed. And the, the fraction that succeed to the point where they can make a living off it are, are incredibly small. So do it, but do it on this. I've done it on the side of full-time work for years. This is the first year I'm able to do it just on its own. 
even though it's still not its own. I still make money in a diverse number of ways. It's not like I get ad revenue I could live off. That's not going to happen for for a decade or a long time, certainly. I think you need to get over a million subs to do that. It's 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 a lot bigger than you think. Um, but then one of the guidance counselors stood up and said, well, I've got a 12-year-old kid in my class who makes a lot more than me because he's got a YouTube channel playing games. So for some, it does work. But yeah, you, you've got to hedge your bets. I think I didn't go into it to make it um, a job for me. I went into it because I, I wanted to to put myself out there a little bit to try and teach and help a little bit and to to get the work that I was doing out, not to get money coming in or fame coming in. And I think because I allowed it to grow slowly, it's taken three years to get to this point that uh, now it just affords me the luxury of shooting whatever I want to shoot and only taking client work if it's interesting or if they're nice people to work with. So it, it's worked out. But it's a it's a gamble for sure. Yeah. The sound design on your channel is 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 particularly good, I think, in the same way that you know, John Williams was uh, was the shark, wasn't he, in Jaws, nice. and and your sound design is a is an exceptionally that's a that's an important part of the recipe, I feel, for for the gentle nature of your your films. Do you labour over that? Mm. I mean, I'll I'll take that compliment from you. That's that's lovely to hear. Um, it, it's it's something I've worked on. Um, I I work I work hard to get clean spoken audio using a little uh, smart lab and a, and a Zoom H1. So that's that's the the basis is getting that spoken word clear. Then I'll always film a little bit of ambient as well because I feel it's important to which is what you do on your podcast, which is a beautiful like getting a sense of space and where you are and uh, and people underestimate that audio is half of video. It's it's as much of the experience if you have video with terrible quality audio will still it will it will be a bad experience so you know recently i went to iceland and i I made a point to film wind and grass and see you know waves on the beach and just layering that underneath a little bit to give a sense of space things people forget to do that that put you in it as much as a good visual and then soundtrack is really important to me um uh, it's it's the thing that takes the longest when you're editing a video is choosing the right soundtrack it's it's I can waste hours on that because, you know, something that progresses in the right, right way. And I, I choose things which are deliberately quite sparse that, that, that don't, you know, a lot of YouTube, I think, is known for a frenetic pace and beats. I stay away from that. I'll search um, ambient cinematic and I will I'll usually search for cello or a particular instrument as well that that gives a lot of space, but a lot of an emotive quality and then try find something that's got. Um, different moods to the piece that I can cut in different sections and slowly layer it out to a crescendo at the end where I'm going to to, to images and I, I know I know a track that feels right when I hit it and obviously I have a sensibility or a, a personality that gravitates towards stuff so I'm quite careful to try and color grade stuff that there's a consistency between videos and I think choosing a music style that's consistent also adds to that consistency as a whole it's like if you watch movie by Tarantino you can feel it's Tarantino by he uses the same cinematographer and lighting he uses the same grading he uses the same sort of you know retro pop soundtrack it feels like it in the aggregate and and I try and do the same thing as well you know um because I, th- I think it, it as much as me talking every time in the way that I talk or the things that I talk about having a color theme and a music theme it feels of a piece when you start if you go to my channel and you view one you want to view another uh, because you you like what you saw it's going to feel the same it's going to feel like a safe space and then anytime you put out a new video they go okay we know what that is that's a safe thing to definitely spend my time on and that helps i think yeah sean's films have a real and i'm choosing these words with a little trepidation effortless quality and by that i mean that the hallowed start middle and end approach just seems to naturally flow while some film and documentary makers labor for hours over storyboarded ideas Sean's seem to organically move and bend and shape. There's direction, but not micromanagement. And I get the feeling sometimes watching his films that it it may just change a little with his mood on a second watch, if that makes any sense. 
I was curious to understand if the final production is closely planned or whether it's allowed to move on the canvas as it's edited. So when, I, when I'm filming, I'll, I'll start by uh, filming all the spoken word parts and getting that done because then I know that's the backbone. I've got all that out the way, so the script is done. Then it's a case of running around and capturing the B-roll to either accentuate what I'm saying or act as those little interstitial pieces between, between stages. Um, and I know what I've shot for where. So... My process normally is to pull all the footage in. I will lay out all the spoken word sections and attach the audio, kill the audio from the video and make sure it's just the good audio and get all that lined up and watch it through once just to feel that the flow of the speaking makes sense and I can chop anything out that doesn't and make sure that the script itself, the lo- I use script very loosely because I don't use word for word, but the script loosely, it makes sense and it flows and there's no boring sections and it, it, it runs then I will lay the music track on and then I will start building B-roll for an intro to time with the music and then into the first section of spoken word and then let the drop the music out while, while they're talking, bring it back up and back into some B-roll between sections. So the editing, I can probably edit through a video if I, if I sit down for a whole day, I can get it done in a day, um, usually. It's, it's the filming that can take a bit, a bit longer and that's where I spend the effort is get it in camera, get the B-roll in my head where I want it and the edit usually comes together. If it's not coming together, I messed up in the filming and that, then I have to rescue it in post. I'm glad you mentioned script because you're one of the few, never mind YouTubers, let's talk about television presenters, that are able to talk to camera for as long as four or five minutes without a single cut, which is a skill in itself. You must have a super memory. <laughs> no, it's it's um I do script but I don't script for the words. I script for for the flow of it and for the concept. So I will I will write something out because I want to test that the ideas work and flow one into the other and write out if if I've got an anecdote or an or an example or a story to tell that the story works as well. It's just the way I process ideas. But then I don't use the script when I film. So usually what I'll do is I, I I'll I'll physically print it out and cut it into the sections that I want to use for different pieces of filming. And then before I film a section, if it's three or four paragraphs long, I will read through it once and then fold it up and put it back in the camera bag. And then I will say that to camera two or three times. And the point is not to remember the exact words I've used. The point is just to remember the flow because I still want it to feel authentic like I'm talking to you and working it out while I'm talking because I am. But the but the concept is is planned and I know where I'm going. But the wording I still have to pick along the way and that gives it a bit of a feeling of authenticity. So I'm not concerned about remembering the exact words. I'm concerned about the flow of it and I'm confident about where I'm going. And a little stumble here or there I keep in because I feel like it's it's genuine then. It feels like I'm having a conversation with you. So it's a balance. I mean, I used to do the same when I preached in a church. I, I would only have, I would script everything out, but on the lectern in front of me, I would have a tiny scrap of paper with with five bullet points. And I would just jump back to, to remember where I'm going. But within that bullet point, I would just talk. And and yeah, I mean, like you, I think people were impressed with that. But because I'd done the work beforehand, I can do that. And, and I, I can have a conversation. I, I wouldn't think about what I'm saying, talking to you over a beer. So I can do it with a group of people. And I know where I'm going. So I'm a bit prepared. And if, you, if, you, if you're not worried about remembering the exact words, and you can, you've got freedom to play within the concept... It's it's a bit of a it's a trick that works for me. Anyway. Well, it works extremely well, and I have an admission to make, Sean, that uh, I, uh, I I I expanded one of your videos on screen because I thought he's got to be reading auto cue. There's got to be. <laughs> I was looking for for the telltale eye movements that that say this person's reading auto cue, and I couldn't see it. Now, now I know you weren't. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. It doesn't. No. It it wouldn't. That would feel stilted for me, and it would. I think you'd feel it in the delivery. It wouldn't feel genuine because then I'd have to be a really good actor because I'd have to sound like I'm thinking about it and working it through while I'm saying it, while I'm reading it. And I'm not that good an actor. So it has to be, it has to be me genuinely thinking about it, working it through. Uh, the authenticity certainly comes across. You, uh, I'm going I'm to fast forward a little bit to a, a, a film you made um, about uh, being an introvert mm-hmm. um, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely intrigued um, at how you, you are an introvert. Because it certainly doesn't come across as that on camera. This is what I tell myself. You have to play the long game. 
You do have some things in your favor though. So for example, if you're an introvert, you probably are a good listener. You're probably not the first person when you're sitting around a group of people uh, at a meeting, you're not the one to start talking and talking a lot. You're probably the one to sit back a little bit and to hear what everyone has to say and take it all in and process it before you say what you want to say and hopefully then it's more informed. And that can be a real asset. What I do when I sit down... A lot of people made that comment on that video is, is you don't come across like an introvert because you come across confident. But I think people miss, for me anyway, they, they miss... They mix up confidence and introversion, extroversion because I think you can be a confident introvert and an insecure extrovert. So, so I think I'm a fairly confident introvert. I'm not insecure, um, but I mean the definite, the most helpful definition I heard is, is an extrovert is somebody who's who's energized and recharged by hanging out with other people. An introvert is energized and recharged by being on their own. And I am definitely energized and recharged on by by alone time. So that by that definition, I'm absolutely an introvert. I need patches of my life where I'm just on my own, thinking stuff through. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, not- Iceland, uh, actually, Iceland would have would have been one of those moments. Definitely, I was there for five days in a log cabin on my own, basically, and it's lovely. I love those trips, and I don't need to travel with other people. I really enjoy that. Um, my wife couldn't make it on that one. She had a she had a funeral. She had to go to. But yeah, I, I decided to take the trip anyway. And uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love those sort of trips. So that, that Snowdonia video was the same. It was four days in Snowdonia in a, in, a, in a cabin on the on the river. And I need those regularly, like every every three or four months, if I can manage just to get away for a few days and, and recharge and think and decompress. I read an interesting comment. I, I enjoyed reading the comments below your films as much as I enjoy watching the films. That uh, I love this, that you're the antithetical embodiment of the Peter McKinnon archetype. <laughs> that is so popular and frequently imitated in this community. And I nodded. Uh, and I, to, to be fair, I recognise myself as having done that as I've experimented with YouTube. Um, do you think people copy too much, or, or is that inevitable, really? Yeah, I think they do. And, and I understand it. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with... with it, it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's like photography. You, you can when you're starting out you kind of have to copy other people's work to give yourself a direction if you're trying to rip one photographer off I think integrity wise you probably have an issue but you're always going to have a loose conglomeration of heroes who you kind of trying to amble your way towards and you find your style in that so I think that's legitimate if you if you're someone starting out in YouTube and you're saying well I like these other YouTubers somewhere in that mix is something that resonates with my personality that's valid to move in that direction but I, what a lot of people do is try and copy a YouTuber because they're successful and it's not authentic to their personality. And then they end up having to fake something that we can feel is fake. And that's a problem because because that's embarrassing for all of us to watch and probably to film and all the rest of it. So um, I, I like that. What I think I've managed to do and, and other YouTubers as well um, We were talking about Jamie Windsor earlier. He's another guy who definitely has his style. He's being authentic to who he is. And I really enjoy his stuff. And there's a few others who do their own thing. Simon Bax is a lovely one who I've done some stuff with as well. He does some beautiful stuff with woodland photography. This is the guy with Meg, the dog. Yeah, Everyone mentions Meg. He's really bleak that Meg is more famous than him. But like, (laughs) um, I'm sorry about that then. (laughs) He, but you know, they're being themselves. And I think, I think this is what people misunderstand or or, or or don't anticipate is that you are going to build a following faster around you being authentically you than you trying to copy someone who's famous or who, who's doing it well you stand a better chance of having a successful channel if you do it your way on your terms because people are drawn to anything that feels authentic so on paper what i do shouldn't really work it's too slow paced it's too it's too navel gazy and a bit self-indulgent sometimes but it does because it, it is it is what I what I want to do and people pick that up I think and there's, there's still people who jump on the channel and go you're just a pretentious douchebag that's okay because because that's how they respond to it but then it's not for them but the people who are built around that channel they do connect with it because I connect with it I connect with it in other people and that builds its own audience and, and that has longevity because I'm not faking something that I'm going to get fed up with or feel like a fake in a year. I can keep going like that forever because it is me. I'm not sure we can make an episode about YouTubers without at least touching on the concept of a feature all platform creators, as they're known in the community, have come to accept, caught or be deterred by, that of the currency of likes. 
thumbs up and thumbs down, and the comments, mostly constructive, but some cruel and ugly by nature and hiding behind anonymous membership profiles. Extending your head above the parapet invites all manner of reaction, but it's something Sean doesn't take to heart. Yeah, I, th I think their psychology, I mean, if you know where it comes from, you, you shouldn't take it seriously because it's, it's, I mean, the one thing I've said in videos before is you'll never find a talented troll. You're, you're not going to go and look at their work and be blown away. They, they usually don't have any work online. And if they do, it's terrible and they're just trying to work their way forwards. So you're usually dealing with a frustrated creative who, who would love to make their stuff work, but can't. And maybe it's too scary to put yourself out there and put your work out there for similar criticism, especially if you know what it's like to be trolled because you, you like to troll other people. So rather than risk rejection or, or people saying bad stuff about your stuff, let's just go and try bring everyone else down. If I can't raise my level, let's drop everyone else's level by trying to pull it down a bit. Um, and that kind of psychology deserves, I think it deserves pity, not anger. Like I don't think I should be mad because someone doesn't like something I've done. Um, instead, I should be trying to help them and say, you know what, it's just a journey. Your stuff will get better. Don't worry about it. Like, just keep going. Um, you don't have to like everything I do, of course, but you, you, you can also watch other channels. You don't have to stay here. And usually you find, it's funny, because usually you find that people who, who write nasty stuff, if I push back a little bit, it straight away turns into an apology and they become kittens. It's like, oh gosh, no, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I really like your stuff. I was just saying, I'm, I'm sorry. And thank you so much for responding. And, you know, they just want a bit of feedback. They just want a bit of attention and somebody to acknowledge them. And the reason I said that, that they're attracted to good work is because what's the point in trolling somebody who's not getting any attention? They're going to find where there's a bit of attention in the field that they're interested in, jump in that comment section and yell about the one thing that they know and, and down you for the one thing they think you did wrong because they think it makes them sound a bit better and hope that a lot of people gravitate towards them in that con comment section and go, gosh, you're right, this is a terrible video, let's follow your stuff which has nothing to follow usually, but that's, that's the psychology, I think. And it never works, but somebody who's frustrated isn't concerned with that. It's, it's coming out of anger and frustration. They can't make their own work work. And, and, and that's, like I say, I mean, I, I, you picture who that is, and it's, I've been that guy. I, I haven't trolled people, but I've been very frustrated that my photography wasn't very good and other people's were. It, it, it turned to jealousy and bitter in, bitterness in me that, that isn't a very attractive quality that I, I didn't necessarily go out and, you know, jump on other people's comment sections, but those thoughts were going on in my head. And if I had been there and they're there and we're all the same, then maybe we just need to, you know, go, okay, it's, it's a journey. But there's also, no, uh, you've talked about this, and, and it's a phrase I, I know of as well, this negativity bias. Mm. We tend to, um, as creatives, um, we will, um, as human beings actually, just yeah. dwell on the negative rather than, than, than consume some of the positive stuff that's being said to us. And often there's more positive than ever there will be negative. Yeah, I mean, you could, I can read 150 comments that are positive. And it's water for ducks back. That's water for ducks back. And then you, you, the one negative, especially if they're right, especially if they found something that like, oh, your audio in this wasn't very good. And you know it's not good. That, that will be the one that sits in your head because as human beings, we, we grab onto the negative. It's, a, it's an evolutionary thing. I, I can't remember the scientist's name now, but he was doing Richard Somebody, who was doing a study and basically he came up with this idea that negative thoughts are like Velcro. They, they grip on, but positive thoughts are like Teflon. They slide off non-stick surfaces. So you have to practice holding any positive thought you have in your head for 15 seconds to give it the same chance to imprint that a negative comment will, will, will automatically imprint. And if you start practicing that, which I, which I try and do now, it balances everything out straight away because you will always get way more positive comments than negative. So if you're imprinting those positive ones in the same way that you're allowing the negative ones, it, it really washes out. You know, it's, it's, it's not something to obsess over. I, I'm, I'm going to sort of close off the YouTube part of this by embarrassing you a little bit more with some of these amazing comments. <laughs> Um, should be a proper TEDx talk. Fantastic video, Sean. A million miles wide and a centimetre deep is a wonderfully evocative way to describe the internet and our relationship to information. I went on YouTube just now to switch my brain off. Instead, you've given me something with depth, but I am grateful for it. I'm a YouTuber for a few years. Another comment here. I'm subscribed to lots of channels, but I can't wait for a new video from you because you inspire me. And honestly, you're giving me hope and motivation. I thought it was lovely. Probably the best speaker on YouTube. 
If you keep producing these videos, you'll have spiritual students as well as photography fans in class. And that's the point I want to sort of close on with YouTube, um, because there is a theme emerging here. And, and if you look to the comments below your films, you'd find people watch you for, for as, as much for the philosophy as ever for the photography. I, I have always had, I, I, let me say first, I love photography and I love filmmaking. I, I'm not being disingenuous by talking about it. It's my passion. I absolutely love it as a creative pursuit. But I always knew at the start that photography was also going to be a little bit of a Trojan horse because there's other stuff to talk about that I think is way more important. Um, and that is what I used to talk about in the church. No, I'm not preaching to people or converting them to a religion, but I always got a kick out of helping people make sense of their lives and, 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 and make them work better. So I'm a big fan of still spirituality. I read across the board um, and now philosophy as well and digging in on that kind of thing. And, and I think a lot about that sort of stuff. And, and so I make a point of regularly either, either slipping things like that into videos or making whole videos about it. I, I just did one recently where um, a workshop I wanted to do in the States didn't work out because the visas are very, very difficult. If you're going to do it legally, it's very, very hard to do. And actually, at the embassy, it seemed that there was no way to do it. They wanted me to get a P1 visa, which was a performer's visa, but I can't apply for that as an individual. Someone in the States, a company in the States has to apply for that on my behalf to bring me over to be able to make money. And I use that experience to talk about what I'm reading about the Stoic philosophers and what you can control and what you can't and, and, and then apply that to people who I know are photographers. So, so I can accept that I can't control that. I can do everything I can do and I can work as hard as I can, but when I hit a wall that beyond the things I can control, that's the way that it is. I can now let myself off the hook and, and move on instead of beating myself up and feeling anxious about it. So how many photographers, for example, are, are really stressed about the fact that they're trying to make their careers work? But a lot of things are out of their control. You know, whether they get hired or not is often out of their control. They can market themselves as hard as they can. That is in their control. But the response or the result or what other people think about their work isn't. You just have to keep going and keep going and not beat yourself up because something doesn't work straight away. So examples like that, I put those into videos all the time because I think that's even more important. I did a video on how do you deal with creative jealousy when you when you know other photographers who are better than you and you're struggling because you're feeling jealous of the fact that they're better than you. How do you deal with that? Um, and those are life skills, things I've learned, which are more important to me than the fact that I know how to use a camera that, that make me a better human being beyond just an artist in a specific genre that I, I always want to talk about. Um, I'm working on a, very slowly working on a book uh, writing a book on on sort of what I'm learning about philosophy after the church and how to live life and you know better yourself and, and using photography as a, as a as a rubric for that as well as you know what I've learned about exposing for lights and shadows and, and how that moves into the way that I see the world and the things I deal with every day as well so that that is definitely a part of me and always will be it's why I got into the church the church is in the right context for me um, but yeah it'll always be a goal for me yeah. For Sean Tucker, certainly at the time of this recording, social media's tentacular nature seems to have found him and is taking a hold. It's not just YouTube where his work is inspiring creatives to communicate and share. His Instagram account, at Sean Tuck, has of this moment of recording above 150,000 followers, which in 2019 makes him a social media influencer, though that phrase seems to be falling out of favour with those who qualify for the status. His Instagram grid is alive with shape and shadow play, abstract and texture, scenes of his travels, scenes of London, the city within which he lives and walks. At first glance, it fits with a great wide-open street photography genre, though he doesn't consider his style conventionally so, as he explained in this late 2017 film Made in Rome, where he shares his street philosophy, and why you won't find doorstep characters surprised by their inclusion in a frame like a Bruce Gilden or Doogie Wallace composition. I think I had a little bit of an insecurity for a while about, you know, is this legitimate street photography if it's not focusing on people? And maybe that's my own strange stereotype. Maybe that's a stereotype you have. But someone commented on, on uh, one of my Instagram photos a little while ago, and they said, your work, especially this photograph, reminds me of Fan Ho's work. And I wasn't really familiar with Fan Ho and I looked him up and you should look him up too. He was a Hong Kong based street photographer. 
and he shot black and white mostly very very contrasty uh, exposed for the highlights dark shadows worked on a lot of geometrical shapes a very filmic feel and people in his shots were very very incidental to the composition just to provide a bit of grounding for it and that kind of gave him permission to follow this track that I was following um, and I think it reminded me, and I've said it on this channel before, but it reminded me that to have heroes in any kind of space in your photography is super important because not that you're going to go out and just try and copy the work they do, but it gives you a target to aim for loosely and gives you permission to move in a particular direction. We took some time after speaking about YouTube to talk more about his photographic relationship with the outdoors. And where better to do that than take a walk? I, I mean, I'm, I'm a... I'm a chicken when it comes to street photography. Like I don't really, I don't really shoot for individuals. I, I funny, I met with um, Nick Turpin yesterday. Do you know Nick here? Yeah. And we were talking about street photography and sort of the definitions of it, and what it is. And I don't know if I'd call what I do strictly street photography because it's not really documenting a place and a time. It's not. It's. Not, I don't shoot crowds of people interacting with each other. Not Joel Meyerowitz or anything like that. And I don't shoot street portraits. I'm not a Bruce Gilden or something like that. I think I shoot more for light and space and, and I step back a bit because I'm, I'm very non-confrontational. I don't want to get in people's faces and I don't know, I mean, some people have a better time of it than others, but I've always, I don't know what it is about me, if I look creepy or I'm, I seem coming a long way off and people seem to sort of clock me and I, I get asked, what did you just take a photograph of? A lot. So I think from that I kind of chickened out and started taking a step back and I mean, I, I mentioned in a video that someone who commented under one of the photos I took that it's, uh, it looked or reminded them of Fan Ho stuff. And he was a guy who I looked at, who again, you could say isn't strictly a street photographer because he posed a lot of stuff. He dodged and burned his shadows in. And, but that kind of resonated with me as, oh, okay, if, if that's legit, then I'm going in a direction that's legitimate. I can just keep going. So yeah, I kind of stand back. I shoot 35 mil mostly. Um, and shoot for light and space and if there is a subject it's more for scale and context than to see who that you can't see who they are they're often a silhouette so yeah that's more what i do i know you don't now but it wasn't so long ago that you were shooting 60 to 70 percent of your street work still on a on a smartphone and that was because you know the day job was shooting products in a studio all day which is very technical, you know, you just need to, especially when you're shooting for a white background, yeah. just get it right in camera and it's micro tweaks on lights and all the rest of it. And I needed an antidote. So that's when I started picking up a, uh, my iPhone every day and just going for a walk and setting myself the challenge of just shoot and post one photo a day, even if it's not very good, just to remind yourself that photography is supposed to be creative. You know? I love that thing that you said in... It was a tip, a bit of, bit of advice you gave, um, where you could uh, use your phone with the headphones plugged in mm -hmm. and uh, look like you're listening to music, but actually the, the headphone jack and the part of the headphone mechanism enabled you to take pictures. Yeah, if you just hit the volume rocker. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, I've seen a few people do it as well. So I usually have headphones in walking around. I'm often listening to, I listen to cinematic soundtracks often because I find it puts you in a different headspace and yeah. You kind of see things in a more cinematic way when you've got Hans Zimmer blasting in your ears. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I, if you turn the camera on then and you, you use the headphone rocker, you can sort of be looking around, holding a headphone piece and sort of seeing things and holding the phone at different angles, not right in front of your face so you're very obvious. And you can be snapping photos close up. I, don't, I personally don't really do that very much, but it's a, it's a nice trick if you wanted to get in a crowd and shoot close up. You're very much an advocate of, of uh, using minimal amount of gear i know that mm. um you certainly don't take that approach of uh, i call it like the golf caddy approach where there's so many bits of glass and a bag that you almost need a caddy to pull out the number seven when you need it mm -hmm. i everyone goes through i certainly did where you, you start out in photography and you you feel like you have to have the best kit and I, i've sort of built up canon stuff and then fuji stuff and and i had you know three bags with four different bodies in it and different systems and 20 lenses and it just didn't make me a better photographer and I, I only ever used a few of those things regularly and I suddenly realized it was, a, it was a revelation day where I went gosh I could do everything with just a little bit and that's kind of when I started to, to strip it back and work out how, how much and now I'm kind of obsessed with this how can I do everything I do and, and how little can I do it with yeah, yeah it's, it's, it doesn't make you better having all those options sometimes it makes it more confusing you know, and you, you I, I, like I say, my street photography 
is is all on 35 mil. I don't take anything else around. I don't. Is that the I don't only need, lens. It's the only lens I use. Wow. It's a little plastic Samyang 35 2.8. Cost 200 quid or something like that, and that's everything. I shoot it on that because I don't need anything else. That's fine. Are you content not to come back with work after a day's walking the streets? No. <laughs> I always want to come back with lots of shots, but it's just the reality, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I'm always disappointed if I come back with nothing. It's not. It's not that it's a waste of time, though. I feel like I always learned something. I might have found. A location which I know will be better in different light or at a different time of year and I know I can go back yeah. there's always something you learn and just being out rather than sitting at home is is always good but yeah I mean I'd always rather come back with 10 bangers <laughs> yeah. this relationship you have with Africa you weren't expecting to end up living in the UK I'm sure I heard you say that once and yeah. and you have this um, this enormous affinity for for Africa what is it about that continent that you love so much I don't know. I th- it feels more... I mean, I was born in the UK, but we, I moved over when my family moved over when I was about six months old. It, it will always just feel like home more to me because it's the place I've lived the longest. I think in total I've I lived there for, I don't know, 25 years on and off. Zimbabwe, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, and eventually South Africa. And yeah, there's, there's always going to be something about that continent. Anyone who visits will tell you it kind of gets in your bloodstream. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy to be back here now, though. I think uh, something about coming back, just because I've been away for so long and did all my growing up and studying and working in Africa, there is a part of coming back that feels like, oh, this is where I'm from. This place thinks like me, and culturally there's something here that, that, that feels familiar. But yeah, I mean, as a, as a place, it will always be very special. It's, it's not... It's, it's not like many places in the world. Um, it taught, and, it, and it made me, it definitely shaped my personality. I think I'm nothing like my mom and her generation in my family because of growing up in Africa. I don't, I, I, I don't uh, keep things to myself. I don't, you know, cover if there's a problem. You know, the British way of like, don't talk about it. It's, it's a bit negative, you know. I don't do that. I'll just say it because that's a very African thing to do is to just lay it, lay it out. Talk, talk about things you know you're, you're a broader community and I'm I'm really grateful for that I think it's it's been a it's been a big part of of who I am and, and also just in the way that I see the world I think when you live in a place like Africa especially South Africa which is a very complicated country I, I arrived after apartheid but again I can I can see what happens with apartheid and and people living with nothing and me having something you know not because I, I did anything nefarious, but it is because I'm white there. And, and seeing that disparity and how complicated the world can be has, has meant that I'm never going to take anything for granted. Coming back here, I'm, I stay very humble about what I have. And people go, oh, you could be so much more successful, so much more money, because it's a very Western thing to talk about. But I know where I've come from, and I'm very happy to live small because of what I've seen and what I grew up around. And I think that's, that's definitely shaped me as well. I feel I've gone out of order with this, but I want to come back to the Namibian trip. Mm-hmm. Because there was something quite important that happened when that work was being printed mm. in, in terms of, um, of, of it being your, your best work or no, m- more, most authentic work perhaps. And that your, your mentoring project, the mentor project, mm. when you photographed your three mentors that we've talked about already, was, uh, was somehow more authentic than the Namibian work that you'd done. Which, I, 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 for what it's worth, I thought n- the Namibian work was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the quick version of the story is I, I came back with those images from Namibia and the, the point was to go over and shoot with the Himba tribe, with these beautiful people who live there. They sort of coat their skin with this red ochre and they wear these red dreadlocks, beautiful looking people as well. Um, and I came back with images I was happy with uh, and took them down to get printed. I did a video with Genesis Imaging here in London, who are one of the top and the, the the head of the studio there who was printing the stuff and I was filming a bit of a video with him about printing your work. I was kind of hoping he'd be, he'd be quite chuffed with these images and go, oh, these are really good. Um, but he really knows his stuff and he, I mean, he prints a lot of the Magnum guys. He's, he's been around the block, you know, and he just said to me that, um, you know, they're technically good images but he just couldn't care less about them really. And he wasn't trying to be unkind but he kind of unpacked it a little bit and said that, that, um, I just don't care about what you've done. They're very interesting looking people and they're technically very good photographs, but I don't care about what you're trying to tell me. And, and when I went away and thought about that, it made 100% sense that I'd gone to shoot very interesting people. That's the problem with shooting interesting people is you, 
is, is have you taken a good photograph or, or or have you just is it a beautiful person in an average photograph or a really interesting person in an average photograph and I thought that what I'm missing and what he pointed out as well is you, you need story or connection to you on some level to, to take it up a level. So that's when I planned the trip back to South Africa for that December and I did a little road trip to visit three of my mentors and then shot a very, very simple black background, one light black and white portraits and triptychs. And those are better photographs. I can see it. I don't think they are as interesting or would be as popular to people who don't know about photography and just looking online, the Himba shots will definitely take preference. But I know these are better photographs because they've got more depth to them. Let's close on your faith. Um, do you go to church? No. <laughs> you were going to say that, but I, I wanted to just, yeah. for clarity, why? Um, there's a guy named Richard Raw who's a, who's a Franciscan friar who I absolutely love reading his books he's he's got some lovely stuff out there and he he wrote a book called falling upward which is really influential for me and he makes the point in that book that we we when we journey in life we go through sort of two halves of life he takes it from Jung, and how in the first half of life you build your box and you you know you that means you decide what you believe about life the universe and anything and and, and who you want to marry and what's the job you want what house you want to live in and what you believe about politics and, and anything else and then at some point in your life, you hit some kind of crisis. Something happens, someone dies, a relationship ends, you lose a job, something doesn't work. And now your box and the, the answers you built about life don't really answer the crisis you've hit. So you have a choice. You can either let the box fall apart and move into what he calls the second half of life, which is looser. You're, you're, you're kind of more comfortable with paradox. You're more open to things being whatever they are. Or you can, you can reinforce the box and move back inside and fight anyone off who ever challenges your question again or, or the way you see the world, which just leads to bitterness. And we know those people. Um, the reason I don't go to church anymore is because I feel like when it comes to my faith, I've moved into that second half of life where I'm more open with paradox. I don't have this desperate need to define anymore. And I want to read far and wide. And a church is a place for people to build their boxes, to define their faith and to work it out because they're starting out with it and I will break people's boxes just by being who I am by being honest about my doubts and 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 the things that I've learned since and the way that I'm able to to think about faith and life now and, and as broad as I can think about it will challenge people who are building something simple and, and in the book he makes the point that building your box is an absolutely essential part of anyone's journey we all have to do it um, it's really important and it's, it's a horrible thing to do to be moving through to that second half of life, which is more open, and going back and smashing people's boxes who are legitimately trying to build them. So I feel like going to church for me would, would be about community. That's the only reason I go. I, I can listen to a sermon online if I want to do that. That's not really what I want to do. If I want to, you know, there's no other reason than to go than to build that community of faith around you. And I wouldn't be welcome in a community of faith because I, what I would say would break people's boxes basically but it's interesting it feels to me like the church has possibly lost uh, a, a strong authentic character to talk to young people at seminary it's almost um you know we've come full circle you as the mentor yeah but i i i i have had to mourn leaving church that i lost my context to do that and strangely i feel like youtube is giving me back that context in a way not that i'm speaking about faith specifically but I'm talking about things I think are important and in the long run not that I want to turn the YouTube channel into that but something might come out of that separately that also develops a context where I can talk about that stuff more deliberately as well so it's not lost and I don't think I mean I know people in church who who miss the fact that I'm not there anymore people in who were part of that structure who were more open-minded but by and large, they're happy I'm gone because I was just a pain in the ass. They're now like, oh, great. Well, thankfully, he's he's moved on because it was causing issues for us. So and they're fine. They're doing their thing. And, you know, they're happy. So good for them. I, I, it, it's better for all of us, I think. Listening to Sean, how his faith has shaped his integrity in building a presence on a platform where the waters of creativity run a little shallow at times, leaves me in no doubt that he seems to have found his own operating algorithm and is happy with the pace of it. As I left his home and made my way back into the city, I sat staring out the train window feeling I'd just watched another of his philosophical films, although this time in 3D. I felt energized, though calm, 
I felt I'd just learned some important lessons about my own relationship with social media. I wished that the train journey could be longer. I was enjoying digesting what I'd just heard, and I'd found my own thousand-yard stare, although not with the emotional detachment. It's little wonder Sean's social media presence and following is steadily and most importantly loyally rising. For many influencers, if you'll allow me that phrase in this program one last time, a growing follower base is where numbers and success can collide awkwardly and create a Mary Shelley monster. And since Sean's films start with a quote, I'm going to end this podcast by quoting Walter Scott's Marmion. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. It's a couplet that I think stands to prove being the real deal may not immediately accelerate your popularity, but being the real deal, being authentic and having integrity is good for the long game and your sanity. This down-to-earth, authentic character Sean Tucker exudes, I think, is the real deal. Music license from Artlist was by Bortex, Dennis Horakowski, Carl Preston, Ian Locke, Michael F. K., Kevin Graham, Thieves, James Forrest and the East Road, Alon Peretz, Tristan Barton and Ben Winwood, with special permission from Johannes Bornhoff. Links to Sean Tucker will be in the show notes, with further references available in the website show notes at photographydaily.show. Until the next time. I hear the road.